So gone is the TPP, India can't breathe, China has no drinking water, but they do have one aircraft carrier, Japan and Vietnam are fishing for new islands, President Duterte is in love with Xi, China is building the new Silk Road, but the Chinese are learning how to speak Russian because they're developing the natural gas fields, India loves Russia for the moment, and the Russians are learning Hindi. And don't forget that bad boy up in Northeast Asia. But we have the panel to set you all straight. Cynthia Watson, Dr. Cynthia Watson, to be more formal, from the National War College. Cynthia, hands up. <laughs> Captain Bud Cole of the Naval Institute, who knows where all the rest of those Chinese ships are. <laughs> Professor Jeremy Haft, author of Unmade in China, and he can give us the inside skinny on the real trade facts. And leading the pack, Shihoko Goto of the Wilson Center's Asia Program, our moderator for the panel this morning. Welcome to all of you. We look forward to your presentation. You. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Mimi, for that uh, very great introduction. The title of this conversation today is Unfinished Business, the U.S. Pivot to Asia. In light of the recent developments here in the United States, I thought perhaps we could rename that title and say, keep America great in the world and in Asia, exclamation mark or question mark. Hmm. Because that is really what we are seeing today when it comes to foreign policy and US engagement in the future. It has been clear, and over the last seven decades, since the end of World War II, that Asian stability has depended greatly on a so-called Pax Americana. And Democrat or Republican, they may have debated and disagreed on how to achieve that uh, power that the United States has, but there is a bipartisan support for the idea of the United States to be this Asian power, to, so that it would provide security, that it would um, be the deliverer of democracy. And why is that? Not because America is altruistic, but because it actually serves America's self-interest. That, I think, is actually being questioned at the moment. Um, certainly, President-elect um, Trump, as a candidate, has questioned the role of the United States in Asia. But post-election, he's kind of turned a, a, a little bit uh, on his many comments, and he's become more of a statesman. And for instance, today, he will be meeting with the Japanese Prime Minister Abe, um, who in New York at Trump Towers. This will be Trump's first meeting with a head of state since the election results. are actually in Asia. The United States, even before Trump, has always said that its allies need to do more, um, the independent countries need to do more for their own defense. So it's not necessarily unique to Trump, but if he were to advise Trump today on how he should move forward with the alliance systems, what would you tell him? Well, thank you. I'm once again honored to be talking to the World Affairs Council. I most recently did that out in Los Angeles uh, in September. Uh, it's interesting that uh, the mention was made of the Pax Americana because we had the Pax Romana, the Pax Britannica, but neither of those nations ever remained the world's most strong, the world's strongest power forever. And uh, the United States Navy, just to throw one factoid on the table, today is less than one half the size it was in 1985. 
and yet has basically the same global presence requirements that it did in that year. So this doesn't mean that the U.S. must abandon or weaken its commitments to the Asia-Pacific because, in fact, the United States is politically and economically and socially and ethnically an Asian power. But what it does mean is that we require a greater emphasis than ever on multilateralism, on our alliances in East Asia. And it would be, uh, to be perfectly truthful, I think based on some of the comments we heard during the campaign, uh, South Korea and Japan are particularly concerned about how the new administration is going to proceed. Uh, we certainly don't want any either of those nations or any other Asian nation that doesn't already have nuclear weapons to develop nuclear weapons, because I personally believe that would be an element of greater instability uh, rather than stability. As far as the allies are concerned that we have formal treaties with, I'll start and just note that Japan is, is our, probably our most important ally in East Asia. And along with Australia, is sort of the north and south anchors of our relationship in that part of the world. Uh, Japan's primary concern, based on their most recent defense guidance, is China. And that represents a large shift from the Cold War, when obviously Japan was concerned about the Soviet threat from the north. Today, Japan is much more concerned about the Chinese threat from the southwest. As far as South Korea is concerned, obviously they're most concerned about North Korea, as we all are, I think. If we look at all the crises in East Asia, none approaches the danger of the North Korean nuclear weapons program. Okay, nothing official has come from the government of the Philippines indicating any weakening of the relationship with the United States. In fact, just yesterday, a new detachment of United States Special Operating Forces from the U.S. Army and Marine Corps uh, went down to Mindanao to assist the Philippine military in fighting insurgencies there. So right now we have a lot of noise and bluster coming out of Manila. Uh, there is some potential for unfortunate events there, but so far officially our relationship with, with the Philippines remains strong. Uh, as does, of course, our relationship with Australia. Uh, the old ANZUS Pact doesn't exist formally anymore, although we are just now reopening a defense relationship more strongly with New Zealand, who had been suspended from the ANZUS Pact back in 1983. Australia is in a particularly um, interesting position right now with increasing economic interdependence with China and the usual uh, military defense relationship with the United States. And my sense is, in just the last few months, that there has been greater emphasis placed in Australia on the relationship with the United States while acknowledging the importance of the economic relationship with uh, China. Uh, in addition to those uh, formal alliances, we also have a strong defense relationship with Thailand based on the old Manila Pact from 1954. Not a mutual defense treaty, but nonetheless a strong relationship, a relationship that right now is somewhat in question because of the military junta that's ruling uh, the Thai government, and with the recent death of the king of Thailand, we now have one more element of uncertainty there. In addition to these formal relationships, I'll also mention the strong U.S. defense relationship with, with Singapore, uh, where we have uh, some ships, not permanently based, but we do have a very warm defense relationship with that island city. Uh, we also have uh, a, a significant defense relationship with, with Malaysia, and our relationship with India is warming every month, uh, which would really be a seismic change if New Delhi were to shift away from its decades-old reliance on Moscow, say, for weapons systems and a strong defense relationship, and begin shifting its uh, interest more and more towards the United States. And I think we see that happening right now. Thank you. Thanks for that great overview. And Cynthia, um, Bud raised some many, many interesting points, but two really struck, um, stuck out. Um, one is the importance of the multilateral approach to security and stability in the region. Um, and the other one is about interdependence with China growing. These, on the one hand, the United States needs partners for security, but on the other hand, it needs to accommodate countries, not just China, but other to their countries that are emerging. How can the United States balance that? 
Let me start by saying I'm the only one on the panel that has the obligation of giving a disclaimer. I am <laughs> still a civil servant, and so everything that I say today are, is purely my own analysis. I also feel, uh, I strongly want to say that I have a very warm relationship that goes back 30 years with World Affairs Council, so it's really a treat to be here. And thank all of you for what you do in your communities every single year because it really does make a difference and we need more people doing it. If I had one criticism, which is not exactly the way you asked the question, but of the way the campaign framed our discussions of foreign policy in general, but especially Asia, it's that there is no apparent understanding outside of the United States that other countries have national interests. We Surely have not. no problem <laughs> asserting that our national interests are very clear. They are security. They are economic prosperity. But then we forget that we are engaging, whether it's multilaterally or bilaterally, with states that have national interests of their own. At times, as a result, we end up cutting off options. And I'm afraid that that's where we might be going in the future with the Asia Pacific, or as Admiral Harris prefers to call it, the Indo-Asia Pacific. It is not new to the Obama administration that we are putting a greater emphasis on this region. People forget that in the last months of Bill Clinton's administration, he actually made what was a tremendous shift in US policy by making a trip to Delhi and trying to engage the Indians. And then the Bush administration additionally tried to engage the Indians. But the reason I mention India and then relate it to the question is because the United States tends, even understanding that we have NATO in Europe, we still tend to approach things in a bilateral manner with an understanding that we will have multilateral relationships, but those are seen as very secondary. And so what the Obama administration, I think, tried to do with the rebalance was put much more emphasis on that. And they were somewhat successful. Uh, all the rhetoric of the campaign aside, the Obama administration certainly raised the role, the visibility of ASEAN and more specifically of US participation in ASEAN meetings across the board over the last eight years. And I view the response by Asia as something much more positive as a result of that. Whether it was President Obama coming to meetings, whether it was sending Secretary Clinton and then Secretary Kerry or other officials, Secretary Carter going to the Shangri-La dialogue in Singapore was very important over the years. But the US participation in these meetings, which the average voter may see as a waste of time because it takes a long time to travel and a lot of money to get to Asia, is something that Asians value as believing that the United States has a genuine extended commitment to this part of the world. What I think is really missing is an understanding that we need to then act on reconciling where our interests come up against the interests of the other states in the region. And frankly, one of the places that that becomes most clear was the TPP. While the TPP was not going to be embraced and was not even open to all the states of Asia, it was seen as an instrument of the United States to become truly anchored in this region. And now we have taken that apparently off the table. But we've taken it off the table in a secondary way. And that is the view in Asia where regimes have to respond to their domestic pressures. Those states need economic growth. They need partners with whom they can interact. China is offering them that. Japan to a lesser extent, because Japan's economy has not been growing at nearly the uh, range that it was in the 1970s and 80s. But what you see is therefore not illogical 
that states in Asia have responded to the entrees from Beijing to set up closer ties. We see that as aimed directly at us. We shouldn't. We should understand that this is states responding to their own national interests. The Obama administration, I think, attempted to address that, but they were not successful because of our own domestic pressures and what we now recognize as a global, as a global uh, antipathy growing towards globalization. Yet globalization, as we've already mentioned because of the uh, intertwining of the U.S. and the Chinese relationship is something that is clearly growing and it's not going to stop even if um, there are some attempts, I think, at um, slowing it down dramatically. But I think the, the use of multilateral institutions is something that the United States will have to work hard to continue because there's now a doubt in Asia there's a secondary problem, and, and I'll just conclude with this, and that is that Asia is a part of the world that pays a great deal of attention to history. We don't tend to pay attention to history. I think we know what happened last week, but I'm not sure we know what happened much further back than that. As the United States tries to encourage our partners to create stronger relationships with other countries, across the region. India's relationship with Japan, uh, India's relationship with Vietnam that's growing. As we've tried to cultivate those uh, secondary webs, the reality is that Asians still have some doubts about that. The role of Japan and the idea of a rearming Japan is one that below the surface still creates some anxiety in Asia. The role of an India that has always stayed west of Malacca still makes people wonder whether a subsequent regime to Prime Minister Modi would withdraw and return back to focusing on an India that is more a subcontinental India. And then the last case I would, would cite is the role that imperialism played throughout this region. What President Duterte is reacting to is an ability to play that imperialist card in uh, the Philippines. And that's not the only country where we see it. So that the, the centuries of imperialism that laid waste as Asian nationalists see it to the region has created problems and has fueled nationalism in this region not the least of which is a great rise in nationalism that we see in China, which will factor into all of what we're talking about. So let me close with that. Thank you. Obviously, there are many, many risks um, facing Asia and the United States. It could play a major role, or it may choose not to play a role in, in reaching to some sort of conclusion or as, uh, contributing to stability in the region. But of course, um, it's not just about um, security. There are economic opportunities in Asia. Asia, of course, is the most populous region in the world. It's also the most economically dynamic, especially given the situation in, in Europe, in the Middle East. Um, this is where American corporations can really profit. But on the other hand, um, the United States will, is, will be dropping out of TPP, whilst the rest of Asia will probably move forward with other alternative free trade agreements. As we look to the new administration, what would a good trade deal for the United States look like? What are, what are some of America's interests? And with the understanding that bad tariffs can backfire, <coughs> protectionism could actually shoot America in the foot. Under those circumstances, how, does, how do we reach a deal? I didn't realize that I actually picked the hot seat of the bunch. <laughs> um, maybe we, thank you, Bill Clifford, for having me. Um, wonderful to be here. Um, just got back from my friends at the Naples World Affairs Council, so thank you to Donna Suddeth and Mimi Gregory. Good to see you bleary-eyed with me today. Um, this, these are important and topical questions, and before I answer them, I'd like to take a step back because America's security posture in Asia is underpinned by our perceptions of China's might 
in the global economy. And China's might in the global economy rests on China's economy, right? How powerful is China's economy? And we've heard for many, many years that China was the world's second largest economy. And indeed, if we follow um, Joseph Stiglitz, the renowned economist, last Vanity Fair, January 2015, he writes an article that says, look, China just surpassed us as the world's largest economy. So themes of making America great again tend to resonate this campaign season, right? If we feel like the sun has set on the great American dream and our economy. Now, in the last election cycle, by a show of hands, who can remember Mitt Romney's campaign slogan? Okay. Talking about remembering last week. Um, I'm just looking at the last tweet, right? Uh, so Mitt Romney's slogan was believe in America, thematically similar to make America great again, and yet it didn't quite have the resonant depth this season. I, I, I would argue part of that is because of the existential economic threat we see from China. Um, if we see the world as flat, and we see China as being able to make everything we can but cheaper, and in this age of information technology, then the flat world tilts east and all of our jobs flow to China. So part of the issue with this, and this is why I want to take a step back, is that the numbers we use to describe China's might are numbers that were derived in the 1930s and before. So globalization has occurred so rapidly that our numbers have not kept up. So I want to talk about two very briefly, which will kind of segue us into trade and tariffs. One is GDP, and the second are trade volumes. So at Georgetown, when I ask my business students, what is GDP, I sort of get a blah, 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 blah. You know, it's, it's pro product, right? Gross product, and yes it is, but um, GDP was developed in the 1930s to measure America's response to the Great Depression. And these days, although there are several methodologies that one can use to measure GDP, um, the standard way to calculate it is through expenditures. So when the World Bank comes up with, with these GDP numbers, they're looking at expenditures across an economy, plus the value of exports, right, what we sell to other folks, minus the value of imports. So, hmm, spending. So if we were to compare our household wealth, and I looked at how much I spent last year, and look, I got two girls uh, in school, there was orthodonture and travel and this and that, and you know, so I spent a couple hundred thousand dollars last year, and you spent 150,000. So therefore, I'm, I'm the wealthier economy. I'm bigger than you are. No, uh, we would look at the balance sheet, right? How much do you own minus how much do you owe? What are your assets and liabilities? Now, economists call this national wealth. So if we compare the national wealth of the United States and China, a different reality emerges. United States household wealth was recently measured by Credit Suisse and the Federal Reserve at $82 trillion. China's household wealth, $22 trillion. When you factor in national wealth, so government assets and liabilities, and you know, our government has some liabilities, <laughs> but so does China, right? So does China. There's still a $40 trillion delta between the United States and China, and that gap is growing our national wealth grew 49% in the past five years. China's 19%. So visions of China's might based on GDP are highly misleading. The national wealth numbers do not show an empire who's seen its better days and who is now fading into the sunset. Um, on the contrary, we remain far and away the world's most powerful, most wealthy, most dynamic economy. And the 800 pound panda in China, you know, has trouble, right? Um, China's drowning in debt, it's drowning in broad money supply. They've got their broad money, so currency plus convertible instruments, is 75% larger than ours. And they're a much smaller economy. So they're drowning in money that's funneling into creating asset bubbles all over the economy. Um, they're drowning in debt, they've got $25 trillion of debt on the books and a lot more off the books. They've got problems with demography, so they've gotten old before they've gotten rich, which is what we've seen in Japan. 
So you have right now, today, more elderly workers in China than young, okay? Um, and so now you have a situation in China where President Xi has to balance where to spend his budget. You know, he just cut back on their increases in, in the PLA budget for the first time last spring. They only increased 5% spending on military because guess what? They're spending more than that on internal security. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to feed a population that's living on a land of scarcity. So we tend to focus on currency, but let's look at China's scarcity. Big country, you can fit their arable land in the state of Texas. So China's got scarce land. It's in a full-blown water crisis, as Mimi said. Three-fifths of the water is already determined unfit to drink, probably more, and bad air. So China, as the great hegemon that's going to take over the world, starts to come into sharper focus when you look at national wealth and scarcity. Now, let's talk briefly about these trade flows because it gets to the issue of trade deals and tariffs. Our trade numbers are also based on a pre-globalization world. They're almost like Ricardian. Remember your David Ricardo and the wine for cloth, right? We're measuring trade in the same way. So when we're looking at trade balances, we're measuring 100% of the value of our imports from the last guy that shipped it to us. So look at this, right? You know, the iPhone has components that are made all over the world, including the United States. We, we don't just do the IP, right? We make a lot of the components. So does South Korea, so does Japan, so does Germany. But we count 100% of the value of this guy as deriving from China, because China was the last guy that shipped it to us. What's China's contribution to an iPhone in terms of value? About 5%, about 5%. So the trade, the very trade volume, gross trade volume numbers we use are not capturing the fact that most of the products we consume contain inputs that are made all over the world, but especially the United States. So if we look at all the things around us that we import from China, you know, the air conditioner vents and the doorknobs and, you know, maybe these lighting fixtures and that microphone, um, all of this stuff contains inputs that are made in the U.S. So this shirt, though it comes from China, has cotton that's made in the U.S. You know, these Chinese shoes, where do you think the leather came from, right? The cattle hides came from the United States. For the air conditioner grill, where do you think the stainless steel came from? Well, China's got a huge steel industry, but they don't recycle. So they ship our recycled steel over, turn it into stuff, and send it back. In fact, every dollar that we spend on Chinese imports, 55 cents at least goes to US companies that make the stuff that go into the imports. Now, most of these companies are small to mid-sized factories and farms. And they're not just arrayed in California, they're all across the country. So if you look at the, con the congressional districts, 92% of them at least doubled their exports to China in the past 10 years. So that's every state, just about every district. And so looking at these distorting trade flows in Asia, we see that China looms large, right? They're the dominant economy in Asia because of these gross trade flows. China it acts like a giant hoover, right? It sucks in components from all over the world, especially Asia, Asian manufacturing platforms, assembles them, and then exports them to the world. And so that's why China appears like this giant trading partner in Asia, when in fact, if you look at value-added trade flows, you see that most of the major supply chains in Asia are not owned by China. They're not controlled by China. They're controlled by the United States, US firms, EU firms, Japan and South Korea. So suddenly when you look at China's trade footprint in Asia, it shrinks tremendously. Also, thank you, I got the high sign. All right, I'll wrap it up. Um, <laughs> but very briefly, also FDI with investment. We think China has the economic clout to beat Asia into submission. If you look at foreign trade direct investment, China doesn't even rank in the top five investors of the top six Southeast Asian economies. The big investors in Southeast Asia are the US, the EU, Japan, South Korea is the largest investor in Vietnam, and in terms of the Philippines, half of the remittances that come into that country come from the United States. So we need to consider our security posture in Asia 
And we need to calibrate it to the expectation that China is more likely going to be a stagnating economy, but certainly does not have the economic clout to be a regional hegemon or a global hegemon. So there's no existential threat to America. On the contrary, we still remain the most dynamic and the largest and the most competitive economy in the world. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I hate to be a Debbie Downer, but um, some, would, some would argue that um, whilst China is not a global hegemon, it already is a regional hegemon in Asia. Certainly when it comes to trade relations, it's not the United States, it's actually China that is the biggest trading partner. Um, <coughs> but those facts aside, what we are, there is a, a shift in the balance of power in Asia. And at the same time, there, there are countries amongst Asian nations that have their own different national interests, their different national identities, trying to carve out a stake, a, a place in the sun for themselves in this very diverse region. But, and, and at the same time, the United States, we're not too sure what, what, what is the United States going to do as a Pacific power, if, if, if it's going to be proud of that claim. But at the same time, now we're actually seeing Russia and we've had this whole conversation for almost you know, 40 minutes or so. And here is Putin and his nostalgia going back to history. It's not, it is really about mother Russia. Um, and there's certainly a lot of interest in uh, developing the Russian Far East. I want to turn it to Bud to, to um, address that, the, the Russian aspirations as, a, as an Asian power before I turn it to the floor for questions. Well, R Russia has been talking about becoming a Pacific power since the uh, late 19th century. Uh, you recall that that led directly to the Russo-Japanese War in 1905, which, in which the Russians didn't do very well. Uh, and following the, uh, the Russian Revolution in uh, 1919, they opened relationships with China on a very sort of post-colonial basis. And that lasted until 1924. And in fact, it's only been since about 1990 that the Russo-Chinese relationship has become as warm as it is today. Uh, at least since the mid-1980s, perhaps earlier than that, Moscow has been announcing that Russia is once again going to build up its Pacific fleet and become an Asian power and a Pacific power. We have yet to see that. Uh, and President Putin simply repeating the uh, goals of, its of his predecessors have still yet to bear fruit. The only real stake that I see Russia having in Asia right now is the potential, and it's still a potential largely, for China and perhaps Japan to be able to take advantage of the Siberian energy fields. Natural gas, Russia is the world's leading uh, uh, site of, of natural gas, for instance. Uh, once they figure out how economically to recover those energy reserves from underneath the tundra. Uh, so I think that despite the words we hear coming out of Moscow, whether that be with military objectives or economic objectives or political objectives, uh, that their uh, potential for becoming a, an Asian power is still pretty tenuous. I, I would just add that uh, the demographic issues confronting China and Japan are much more profound in Russia. And so as you think about or as you have conversations with your friends who read you know, these headlines that can be pretty amazing sometimes and usually wrong, think about the domestic challenges that face any regime. And the demographics facing Putin probably are inverse to his chest thumping because there's a lot of psychology going on with the dynamics in Asia as well as Russia's attempt to return to its position as a, quote, great power. Uh, I, would, I would agree and add just very briefly that um, we are seeing the Russian economy, uh, unfavorable demographics, and a shrinking yeah, exactly. growth rate. Right. And yet, you know, Putin's able to wield some power in the, in, in the region and in the Middle East. And so um, although China, um, and I think all the economic signals point to stagnation, mm. Um, it's still far and away a larger economy and a more powerful economy than Russia, and so it still has some teeth to exert some power um, in the region. But I guess the difference is I feel strategically we need to be looking them 
you know, less like this existential threat that we typically hear um, and more like a highly fragile superpower. Could I just add one word that we haven't mentioned yeah. that I think relates to what all of us are talking about? And that is we need to consider geography mm. when we look at Asia. And part of the reason I think that China remains so central in the discussions in the region is because China is most of Asia. And people forget that, whether you're looking at Obor and the One Belt, One Road initiative, and China simply moving west from its traditional uh, geography in the east of Asia, or whether you're looking at the Strait of Malacca, geography matters. And, and we forget that because it's a long way from here. So it's easy for us to come home, but China is always going to be there, as is Russia. Right. And China is indeed the Middle Kingdom. And if you do look at that map, one of the things that worries a lot of Asian com countries is the fact that the United States is not right. geographically in there. Right. And so it seems that the United States has the option to either opt in or out. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we do really need to be very wary of that geographical presence. OK. Um, I believe there are microphones um, on both sides. If you could raise your hand and uh, uh, identify yourself and ask a question. I think we have one hand there. Uh, thank you so much for uh, your great words today. Um, I'm curious about what you think the role of China's uh, foreign direct investment in other countries outside of Asia. So all the railroads they're building in Africa, the canal they're trying to build in Nicaragua. How does this impact the conversation we're having today? Um, that, that's, that's a great question, and it, and it certainly colors the, the atmospherics, right? The perception that, that China is not being encircled by the United States, but encircling us <laughs> by investing all over the world. Um, you know, one, of, one of the countries and one of the top countries that China invests in is the United States. In fact, China's investing more in the US than we are in them. <laughs> and often when China invests, you know, they like to kind of throw in some goodies as well, like infrastructure. Um, I'm not sure how much of you caught the story about the San Francisco Bay Bridge, um, which was recently renovated. And the deck plates, the football field long deck plates, um, were sourced in China from a major state-owned enterprise. In fact, California turned down Obama's stimulus money so that he could go to China and source the stuff. Um, the American inspectors on the ground were saying, stop, you know, the weld quality is random and the welds are cracking. So, the inspectors were fired and the tolerances were loosened. And now I would stay away from that bridge in the next earthquake. Um, but you know, having worked with state-owned enterprises for many years, I can tell you that this is not um, idiosyncratic to a single state-owned enterprise. That in fact, China's multi-decade long um, protection of its state-owned enterprises um, has rendered them some of the least competitive and least safe companies in the world, such that major builders like Halliburton, and companies like Shell refuse to source Chinese steel on their projects because it shatters all over the world. So the One Belt, One Road project and this infrastructure building in Africa and the like, um, I, I tend to look at skeptically because the inputs are unsafe. And so if you look at China alone, it's seen tens of thousands of safety scandals just in the past few years. Roads are collapsing all over, bridges, high-speed rail, and then food and drugs and all this. So I don't necessarily see the building of risky and shoddy infrastructure around the world um, a, a threat on American interests. Could I just add on the Nicaraguan case mm. as an example? That's, that's where yeah. you need to remember that a lot of the initial announcements are making the headlines. Yes, the, the Chinese are going to build this canal that people have been trying to build for 175 years. But the truth of the matter is that project has died on the vine. And the Chinese investment in Latin America, where I've spent a fair amount of time looking at it over the last 15 years, that Chinese investment hasn't played out, in fact. There's lots of grandiose announcements in many cases, but they don't carry it out. Or they become enmeshed in places like Venezuela where things aren't going very well. So it, it, it has a political dimension as well. 
And I think it's also important to um, bear in mind the, the recipient side of this. So whilst China is the biggest investor in Africa at the moment, um, many governments are more increasingly wary of mm -hmm. um, Chinese ODA because of the lack of technical assistance and cooperation that would usually come from um, ODA from other countries such as, such as Japan, where uh, technical assistance is an integral part uh, of that aid. An investment. Yes. Good morning. Uh, my question is, how much, if any, has the um, Chinese and Russian move into cyber warfare attacks, uh, domestic spying, uh, trying to find secrets, maybe influencing things like elections? Um, how much has <laughs> this changed some of these traditional apple carts economically, politically, militarily. Thank you. Who would like to take that? Well, I think that uh, every time I ask a, a cyber expert to explain something to me, I'm told I don't have the necessary clearance, <laughs> uh, <laughs> even when I still had an SCI. But, but having said that, I think cyber is simply the, the latest development in the centuries-old development of new military technology. I don't think it's some kind of magic bullet. Uh, when I think back to uh, when I was at sea during the Cold War, and we were very concerned about what we called in those days electronic warfare and being able to operate in these developing electronic environments and so forth, this is simply sort of the next stage. And I think from a military aspect, it's simply being, de being dealt with as another development in military technology. Uh, as far as I'm personally far more concerned about the economic impact of some of this uh, cyber stuff, and I'll turn that over to my, uh, my co-panelists <laughs> for that. <laughs> Again, the chair gets hot for me, but I, I'll, try, I'll try to answer that. Um, so, you know, clearly we've seen, um, especially in regards to China and the United States, I mean, you know, Russia is a separate topic, and the, the recent election um, is certainly a topic. Um, but in terms of economic espionage, um, you know, China has engaged in the, the wholesale theft um, of uh, everything from military systems to utilities to um, steel, to, to, to making steel. Um, you know, I, I would only say that having, again, worked in the Chinese supply chain for 20 years, I can tell you that, you know, just because you steal a terabyte of data on how to make a stealth fighter, you know, doesn't mean that you can make a stealth fighter reliably again and again and again. And what we tend to forget as Americans is the, the, great, the true greatness of being the beneficiaries of 400 years of evolving corporation law and corporate governance. And you can't make high quality advanced manufacturing without well-run, well-governed, transparent companies. And I mean, obviously we're not perfect, but we're light years away from how the state-owned companies tend to operate in China. And so, yes, I don't mean to underplay, I think, the severity of the theft, but I would highly downgrade China's ability just to leapfrog us on our most advanced technologies. That's not to say that we shouldn't harden our defenses, and I believe we should, and, and probably project power in cyber. I imagine we already are. Um, but I, I would hope that we could sort of dial down the breathless, China's going to leapfrog the United States in manufacturing just because they steal all this data. Um, it's not happening on manufacturing, and it won't happen um, militarily, at least in terms of systems development, for a long time. Could I, yeah. oh, could, could I just add that this is the heart. I think what Jeremy's talking about is really the heart of what Xi Jinping wants to do with his reforms, right. is not so much just to get the party in line, but to guarantee a system that is able to be reliable domestically on things like production and everything else because that lack of rule of law means it's a free-for-all right now. Right. Sorry, but. And I just, I'll just note that interestingly enough, uh, if we go back to uh, Deng Xiaoping and Zhang Zemin many years ago, they wanted to de-emphasize the state-owned enterprises Correct. and develop right. more of a capitalistic economy. Mm -hmm. And just within the last couple of months, Xi Jinping has been addressing the need to strengthen the state-owned enterprises and he's, he's talking about this not so much in economic terms, 
as he is in increasing the political reliability and the pureness, the purity, of the state-owned enterprises, which strikes me as sort of counterproductive if you're interested, if your goal is to increase the economic efficiency of the state-owned enterprises, which simply means that he's right now placing more emphasis on political reliability, I think, than he is on economic efficiency. Uh, yeah, I agree. And just a quick two-finger. I mean, we saw Hu Jintao actually pivot 180 mm -hmm. degrees away from market, market reforms, you know, towards um, placing state-owned enterprises and state-owned banks at the center of the engine of China's economy. Remember, 95% of all banking assets in China are still owned by the state. So this is not a commercial financial sector. Um, and the state-owned enterprises, as the engine of growth, have, have been the basis for this unbalanced, unsustainable growth, where you have debt growing four times faster than the growth of the economy itself. Um, and uh, again, I mean, the reforms of President Xi seem really to be nipping at the edges of this. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's promoting kind of public-private partnership. You know, that's not what's needed. I, right. you know, I would argue going to the, the, the heart of the matter, you need, <laughs> you need rule of law, right? I mean, that's enforceable across the country. Um, and you need, I would argue, John Locke. You need to be able to own your own land, okay? Which is still not the case in China. So um, this is why the agricultural sector is so fragmented with 140 million small family farms. Um, so these drastic reforms were not undertaken when China was growing fast. Now when it's in trouble, um, the really tough reforms, I do not see any indication that they'll be taken um, anytime soon. I agree, yeah. but, but I, my point is that I agree entirely. Yeah, I agree. For one thing, I think it's because we all need to remember what's going on here mm. is she is trying to protect the Communist Party Agreed. and keep the party in power. I agree. have no doubts about that at all. But I think he recognizes that both the public skepticism about the stability of the system, mm. public skepticism about the party, mm. as well as understanding that they have had all of these infrastructure projects collapse. Right. They have coal mines that have right. tremendous problems regularly. All that again calls into question the party. And so and that's what, right. exactly, right. that's what he's worried about. I agree. Yeah. And I think that's why one of the reasons this whole possibility of China joining TPP down the line way in the future, that was a signal that Beijing might mm -hmm. be able and willing to adapt to those international rules and the rule of law yeah. and press for structural reform and domestic mm. change, and that the internationalists within the Chinese Communist Party would use the TPP regulations as the, the force, the, the external pressure to move forward on this. But now that TPP is not moving forward, that becomes moot. Anyway, um, yes, I see uh, the lady over here. Deborah Schultz with the uh, World Affairs Council of Greater Cincinnati. You mentioned the water problem in China. I think I would like to hear you speak a little bit about other environmental degradation, not just in China, but in, a, in Southeast Asia and the, the effects of climate change. I, I will just uh, talk for a second. We, we could spend the whole day talking about environmental <laughs> degradation in China because there's so much to choose from. But I will say that climate change issues are becoming profound in Southeast Asia in particular. And I would cite two things. One is with the rise in sea level, Vietnam that has been extraordinarily successful at cultivating rice over the millennia can no longer guarantee that they can produce their own rice. The US Embassy, uh, I was in Hanoi in 2011, the US Embassy was very proud of the fact that it was able to provide environment, technical environmental assistance. And that's one of those ways where the rebalance played out in the region because we were addressing one of the key concerns for Vietnam, which was how to feed its own people. And so the issue of climate change, which Admiral Locklear at Pacific Command talked about several years ago and was roundly poo-pooed in this town, it's real for Asians. The other thing I would mention is uh, the burning of trees in uh, Indonesia and the blowback of that uh, terrible uh, effect onto Southeast Asia, not just Jakarta, but Singapore, 
uh, into Malaysia. That's real, and it's happening on an annual basis, and it is affecting people from this country, for example, willing to go work as expats in that region because they're afraid to take their families. Yeah. So it's real. Uh, I'll also note that uh, what Cynthia was talking about in terms of the reduced rice uh, poss crop poss possibilities in Vietnam is due to the increasing intrusion of salt water into the Mekong River Delta, a problem that's exacerbated by China's damming mm -hmm. on the upper Mekong, or Lan Song River, uh, which is affecting all the Southeast Asian nations as the Mekong River flow uh, is, is slowed down because of China's uh, need for, for damming these uh, upper reaches of the river for uh, energy supplies. So, so briefly, um, if we look at the economic implications of this, we see um, a, you know, a region that is struggling with climate change. So not just China, but a region dealing with scarce land, scarce good air, scarce water. So when we talk about um, the binary choice of whether the United States should anchor Asia or not anchor Asia, we're anchoring Asia because we're endowed with pretty plentiful land and water and air. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we are exporting agriculture to China in a huge surplus. Because China and the region will continue to have structural demand for our ag and our food. China just bought Smithfield, right, the world's largest pork producer. And everyone thought, well, Sunday mornings will never be the same. I mean, the, we still have bacon, right? And yet, China needs more and more and more. You know, my, my company is an exporter of pork. So even beyond the Smithfield supply chain, there's so much depth that, that the United States needs to cover in terms of food. Now, Europe can provide pigs, but without the volume that America can provide. So regardless of trade deals, you know what I mean, and if tariffs, tariffs go up, I would argue, yes, that'll have a pernicious impact on many jobs in this country, especially the folks who are making the inputs. But despite the tariffs, China will still need safe, plentiful food. And they will continue to rely on the United States as a major source of that food, regardless of whether TPP is in place or RCEP or any number of trade deals. That, you know, that demand will be driven by scarcity. And scarcity is going to drive the next century. And that's one of the other reasons that China is in, involving itself in other parts of the world. Latin America right. has become a tremendous source for China to buy soybeans, for example. And that's because they know they can get them reliably from that region. All right. I think we have time for one more question. I see a gentleman over there. Yes, uh, Ed Martins, uh, World, World Boston. Um, there's one country you haven't talked about, which is uh, rather large and sits on oil in the Malacca Straits, is Indonesia. Um, I don't know the exact numbers of it. It's a very large population. And right now, there's, ri there's riots going on in their capital city because they elected a mayor who was Christian. It's a mostly Muslim country, yet apparently he's been accused of uh, blasphemy or something. I'm curious what you see the future in Indonesia. It is a, a democracy, um, and it's it's very large, fractious, and, this, and what you see going on in there in Indonesia, too. Indonesia is a place that has, it, I think Indonesia is the least understood country in, this, in the United States in terms of its importance. That's just my personal assessment. Uh, I think part of what's going on right now with the rioting has a subtext you didn't mention, though. The overwhelming majority of Christians in Indonesia are Chinese. And the ethnic Chinese minority issue, like in other countries, minority issues are, are important and have created a, a substantial amount of tension over the years. But what you see in Indonesia, I would argue, is right now a thriving democracy. But I think we should never take for granted that thriving democracies, once they are put into effect in Asia, will remain. And the example I would give you is Thailand where several years ago, 20 years ago, people thought Thailand had finally crossed into the realm of democratic states. We no longer say that, and I think we're very pessimistic. I think most people are optimistic right now about Indonesia, but it is a country overwhelmingly focused on domestic issues to try to keep itself together, because it is such a mishmash of cultures, religions, uh, and just geography, 17, again, geography, 17,000 islands that extend such a vast area for 268 or 280 million people.
Um, yeah, if I could quickly add to that, uh, we you know we often hear of the RCEP, you know, which is um, to be a regional sort of ASEAN China trade deal um, as the counter to, T to TPP. So okay, TPP was incinerated, and suddenly ah, oh, here comes RCEP, and this is a chance for China to push us out of the region. Um, it's in fact an ASEAN-led deal. Um, the last deal, which China was leading, was squelched by ASEAN. Um, the Southeast Asian nations are leading the negotiation and the structuring of this deal, and Indonesia is the chair. So Indonesia is really providing a lot of the leadership for the economic direction of, of the region. And again, sort of China's looming large over this deal um, is, is a bit of a misconception. I'll just, I'll just note that I don't think any multilateral effort in Southeast Asia has been established or succeeded without strong Indonesian sponsorship. Mm -hmm. And as far as uh, relationships with China and other nations are concerned, uh, Indonesia is as nationalistic or more so than anybody else in the region. And it's also home to the world's most um, populous Muslim yes. yeah. um, population as right. well. And so as we look to the United States on its immigration policy and how Washington deals with the Muslim, um, Muslim Americans and Muslims coming into the United States, that will invariably have implications on U.S.-Indonesia diplomatic relations as well. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, uh, the time has come for us to uh, say goodbye, but I wanted to thank um, Mimi for organizing this, uh, Bill Clifford for really putting together such a great conference, and I hope you will join me in thanking our three speakers for this conversation. Thank you.